Hey guys, I'm Matthew Moth, the host of the Truth About Real Estate podcast. And today we are talking with StackSource co-founder and CEO, Tim Malazzo. StackSource is a tech-enabled commercial real estate financing platform that has completed more than $250 million of commercial financing transactions. They are reinventing the stagnant mortgage brokerage model with the tech-enabled marketplace service. Welcome to the show, Tim. I'm so excited to have you here. Matthew, thank you so much for having me. First off, I want to ask you too, like, how did you get started in real estate? And then like, why go into the lending side of real estate? Yeah. Uh, so my first exposure, Matthew, to real estate came growing up in the New York City area uh, where my dad was a commercial real estate broker. Nice. Um, and so he was commuting into New York uh, from where we lived in New Jersey. And so real estate initially for me was stories around the dinner table about what my dad did for a job and the, the work that he did in helping um, landlords fill up their uh, properties. And he was specifically on the leasing side for office buildings in New York. Um, and, and that was real estate was these stories around the dinner table. Um, I later went on to study finance um, as an undergrad. Um, and I was interested in the business of real estate and uh, interned at a big real estate company and uh, also in financial services. But I didn't think that I had the makeup of a broker to be calling on these billion dollar office landlords in New York and, and to follow in those footsteps. And I started to learn more and more that my interests were in technology and in software. And um, so I, I was captivated by what was going on in tech and what the world was going to look like in years to come. Uh, and so I actually started working out of college at big tech companies. Um, so my first job out of college was actually in advertising technology for Google. Um, and I went on to work at Google for a while and then a startup that got acquired later by Facebook. Um, and I got pulled back towards real estate because I realized that real estate tech is actually a huge opportunity, something I was really passionate about because it combined that early passion for real estate with what was my growing passion for technology companies. Um, and it also helped me scratch my entrepreneurial itch to, um, to try to start my own real estate tech business, which was ultimately StackSource. Nice. Let's talk about that too. Like, isn't it funny how our parents can really drive us to like really think about what they're doing, how they're doing it. And you said real estate at the dinner table. That's so funny because I grew up with real estate at the dinner table for years and even as my kids and babies, we're always talking about real estate at the, at the dinner table. Like our conversations around dinner with all of our family and extended family is all about real estate. And that's unique and kind of fun. And it's good to see you guys have that same spirit too. And yeah. really you, you took it in as you grew up and you probably learned so much more from your dad at, at the beginning years. And you don't, then you realize, and when you think back behind it, like, wow, you're getting so far ahead because you, you heard about it for years to come as a kid growing up in real estate. And then you mentioned the other fun side, the thing I love too, technology. Technology is a great thing too, because you, you went to corporate world, you did the tech, you learned the real estate, you see the differences too. And, you know, you started creating a company called StackSource. Can you, when you look at real estate and you see the technology being in place now, you're like, wow, it could be so much better in the tech world. It's like this, but in the real estate world, it's like this. Why is that? How can we make it better? And why hasn't anyone done that for so long? It can be like real estate for me is some, some parts of it of it are really archaic. Why sh isn't that way better now? Well, I understand the market. There's you know real estate agents, their technology. Not everyone wants to mix the technology side. It's all relationship sales-based business. But I'm like, no, technology can enhance that relationship. It can make it so much easier and faster. Everyone wants one-click shipping, one-click everything. I want an instant gratification. So why isn't real estate catching up to it? Now there are companies like yours, like Rocket Mortgage and like other big companies who are coming into the field in prop tech building it up fast as they can now. Yeah, I would argue it's come a long way in the last 10 or 20 years and that the industry is going to continue to evolve faster and faster from this point. Um, so if you think about the process of even let's let's go to the most basic real estate transaction that your average consumer can think of looking for a home uh, in the process of looking for a home, getting that transaction done, getting your mortgage. It's completely different versus what it was, you know, not even a generation ago, but just a decade ago. Um, so today, real estate agents and real estate service providers more broadly, it's less and less about 
hey, I'm holding all the cards, I'm holding all the information. You may have information to share and insights to share with your client, um, but more and more you're seeing, seeing transparency in the industry where I can look at what houses are available. You don't have to have an MLS subscription to see what's on Zillow or to see what's on Redfin or see what's on um, you know, a website. What you really need a service provider for is to answer the questions from an expert perspective, because it can be scary to get a transaction done, especially when it's your first or one of your first, um, to see what else am I missing that I don't see on my end? Uh, what are the insights that are gonna help me to make the most of, out of this transaction? And that's certainly happening in both residential and commercial. Um, and so for us, um, you know, the financing process is what is what we're working to evolve. And on the residential side, You'd be shocked if you can't get a quote and an accurate quote very quickly on how much mortgage can I afford and what is my interest rate going to be? That's something that you, a consumer, expects to have a very quick turnaround time and transparency, and then a transparency into what will that process look like to actually close on this mortgage and close on this house. Um, and in real estate investment and multifamily and, and commercial real estate investment, which we focus on, it needs to catch up. So when you look at the commercial side of real estate, the lending side of it, how far back do you think it is compared to the residential side? And how many, how much time do you, your company and other companies need to catch up? It's at least five years behind where residential is on the commercial side. And that may not just be for financing. That might be just more broadly. Um, so in commercial, um, at the top end of the market, you have behemoth companies that own billions of dollars of real estate. But... Your average real estate investor is somebody that maybe they've put together a couple of deals or they've done some flips or they've done some housing. They may be getting into multifamily or commercial for the first time. There are more transactions done, smaller transactions, but more transactions done by somebody that is somewhere between a mom and pop investor to like a small regional real estate investment team. That's where most of the transactions happen. Um, couple things about these people. One, they're people. So if they see something on the consumer side that, hey, I get transparency into my mortgage options and, you know, I'm, I'm expecting that I can search properties this way. And they're going to they're going to start to expect those same trends in their work life, which is their real estate investment life. So that's that's a trend. These are people and they're going to expect to be treated like people with transparency and, you know, everything they get as consumers. Um, another thing is that data is really catching up. Um, in real estate holistically. Um, but in commercial real estate, there's been traditionally, there have been a lot of gatekeepers to getting good data about how much property should be worth, about how other property, how profitable our properties, um, you know, what are what are typical trends and what's going to affect the, the cash flow or the income or the uh, or the value of my property. Data is starting to catch up. Um, bigger, chunkier transactions really in commercial means that the market will always move somewhat slower than residential where there's millions of transactions going on for consumers. So there are structural reasons where it's a bit behind, but nobody wants it to stay in the past. Well, I'll say the end users don't want it to stay in the past. End users of real estate, um, investors in real estate, they want to get it at any advantage they can. And if a technology is going to allow them to close something quicker, if it's going to help them to make more money on their property, if, if it's going to make it cheaper to own their property. All of these things are advantages for an investor. So they want these things to progress. Yeah. And I, even for me, like I do commercial real estate as well. And I see that the, the that side of the landscape is a little bit different. Like, yeah, you mentioned gatekeepers, you know, there's big companies out there who are holding a lot of the data and you even see them, they don't have all the data either. They call all of us agents and ask us, Hey, you just sold this property. And can you tell me more about it? Can you tell me the rents about it? Can you tell me everything about it? So they can put it into their system. And it's, but then when they get it, they gatekeep it still. Right. And when you start looking, even Zillow doesn't have all the records. Like when you look at commercial real estate and the county records, they don't have all the records on Zillow either as a comparison. So there's definitely, you know, lack of transparency in that sense. It makes it so much harder to really analyze data. You have to become more of an expert, know your area, know your market, know the numbers, be behind the scenes as agent. You go to look at every single property. You're getting upfront data, but it's not consolidated into a system where you can just quickly analyze all properties and say, hey, here's the here's all the reasons why or why not to buy this property and how the numbers make sense how you add value and how do you start maximizing the profits on that building 
as a investment. So that's a little tricky part. And then when you start becoming a syndicator and you start looking at big deals, you're still analyzing everything through spreadsheets too. There's no one system that can analyze all the data. We build massive spreadsheets to have calculations for everything in a massive deal, but there's no one system that has that. And you know, going back, having to tie that into the financing, running all the numbers and seeing how it really progresses over a three, five year hold. And how do you really pop out the value and cash out refi within a three year period? So it's like, you know, it gets, gets tricky up there. And then on the lending side of things too, you know, looking for commercial lenders, you know, everyone commercial wise has to do all these different valuations and, you know, analyze the property to figure out, can they do the loan depending on what you're doing, right? So it gets tricky. And another for small mom and pops, they get stuck because one question they ask, have you ever done a investment into a commercial property? No. Okay, great. I won't give you a loan or I make it really hard. Uh-huh. Okay, well, I'm trying to start. I can't get a loan. How do I get my first property? Yes. Right. You got to get a partner. It's now. a catch 22. It's a catch 22. I'm like, okay, well, if you had all these single family investments and things like that, it still doesn't equal to like a five plus unit. And I get that. But then how do you give them a chance to start? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I, so honestly, um, a first a first deal for an investor is always more risky, right? Because mm-hmm. they haven't made their mistakes yet. They haven't learned their lessons yet. And so experience is one of those things, just like in the job market, right? You get experience any way you can. And how do you, how do you break that if you're looking for your first job, to use that as an example? So if you if you look at jobs and employers want people with experience and you don't have that experience yet, how do you break it? Well, internships, people you know, doing work for free or for cheap or getting what you can or doing volunteer work, filling up your resume in other ways. Um, everybody starts with a first deal, but the question will be, what is your resume and your track record as an investor? Like why, why should um, a bank, for instance, uh, and banks typically are more conservative than some other lender types, uh, Matthew. So that's going to be the other part of the answer. But why would a bank give 80% of the money to buy a, a multifamily property to someone that's never owned a multifamily property? And that's like the riskiest person because they can make all these first time mistakes and, you know, lose value in the property. Well, There are other things you could put on your resume. Have you partnered? Have you invested in other deals? Having a partner that has a higher net worth, more liquidity, more experience than you, that's that's another good route to go, is partnering on deals early on, um, being one of the partners on a deal. And then you can point to that as your track record. Um, So that's kind of borrowing the track record of someone else on your team. So team can be an answer. Resume and other things you've done with properties can be an answer. And then sometimes the answer too is, well, it's not going to be a bank. Um, this is a, a fairly value add deal. It's a little bit riskier. Who wants to take the risk along with the first time investor? It may be a private lender. Um, you know, and that might be a higher interest rate than banks and credit unions, but they may be more flexible in their underwriting. They may um, be able to take a credit risk that um, a bank or credit union cannot. Um, so that may be the other option is you know, going with um, a transitional lender, a bridge lender, Um, that can help you get the deal done. You don't want to keep their money forever because it's higher interest rates. But once you succeed with the property, you can refinance them out. Nice. And that makes total sense, especially for yeah, small mom and pops. You got to get your foot in the door. You got to do something. You got to get there. You got to find different ways to get to that spot where you want to be. So yeah, like you mentioned, JV deals, be a GP, general partner with a deal, work with someone who has experience or who has the net worth and assets, who has done it. It makes it so much easier to do your first deal because even for my first deal, it wasn't easy at all in the commercial space. Even with my years of track record, when you're getting financing in the commercial space, it's completely different. And even with experience, they still want to see all these certain criteria. So it makes it so much easier when someone has done that and has a track record, you can leverage it and then you can start scaling way faster. Now, last right. year, we got, we got into 588 units last year as general wow. partners. That's amazing. That's a lot of fun. And now we're scaling this year probably to another thousand. But before that, it takes so much work to even get your first door. You know, you got to yes. understand. You know, <laughs> so it's a big way to build it. So like when you started doing lending and, you know, you started learning about the commercial side of lending, what made you guys de- decide to create stack sourcing? Like, why is that even any different from anyone else? Yeah. Um, so the, the key word here is going to be transparency, Matthew. Mm-hmm. So um, when you look for a home and you, you want to see how much can I afford and what's my rate, there's a level of transparency there that we did not see on the commercial side. Uh, and commercial, it's actually a, a more even more difficult problem because... Um, there is not one 
typical standard mortgage uh, on the commercial side. Commercial mortgages um, are varied and they're pretty different than residential. So um, you have different leverage thresholds based on the asset type, based on the sponsor's experience, based on uh, the location, the cap rate of the property, how much you need in a, in a down payment, how much you need in equity to go into the deal is going to vary. Um, the interest rates are going to vary more widely. The loan terms available, prepayment penalties, recourse. There's all these things that are different from lender to lender because each lender sets their own lending criteria and they have their own style of a term sheet. And you're not going to have that same level of conformity and transparency into what are mortgage rates today when you're talking about commercial mortgages. So we saw that as an even more acute need in the commercial mortgage side to say, hey, based on this deal I'm working on, what are my available financing options? And so that was the very basic idea behind StackSource. Why is there not an online portal where I can put in, here's the deal I'm working on and find who are all the lenders and the loan programs that I might be able to access that are actually relevant on this deal? That makes sense too, because when I, when I, when I help my one of my clients do a you know, deal for their property and their newer investor, you know, the thing came, comes up with like, okay, how do you teach small mom and pops to really think about commercial investing and to get into bigger units, like uh, 18 unit, for example, for us. Um, and the first question comes back to, okay, based on my experience as an agent investor, I already, I already know some bits of it, but at the same time, when you educate small mom and pops, there's multiple lenders out there in the commercial space. Really, you, before you're even buying a property, you should spend time understanding each person's, each bank, each broker's um, products they have available and what they can do for you and how it makes sense. The challenge I see with that is, okay, well, you know, when you don't have a property identified, you know, what kind of incomes are you looking at? What's the percentages? What's the calculations? And do I qualify? If you're a first time buyer, I don't know yet, but even then you should really educate, okay, What's the product? What's availability? What's a step down clause? Like five, four, three, two, one step down. Is it recourse, non recourse? You know, most small mom pops can't get a non recourse. They're going to get a recourse loan in the beginning. Yes. So, do you know? Do they understand what that means and how does that affect personally affect their business? And right. if you had a big um, player K KP, then maybe you can get a non recourse. But these are things people need to educate themselves with. And it's nice, like if StackSource has those that information laid out in a website with identifications on here's the options for you based on property types that makes it easier as a consumer end to be able to run these number scenarios. So I can know what the target It's kind of like a chicken and egg. You say, if I don't know, I can't do it. But if, once I know I can't compare it, it gets a little tricky, but if you give information up front, I can start drilling down on your website. Here's different areas, different cities, different States. You, you guys support it. I can run all my numbers. This actually makes sense. Let me go target the property. Now, let me work with Tim and then get the loan on it, right? Yes, and and the trick is there are no pre-qualifications for yeah. commercial mortgages. And so you may underwrite a deal, figure out, hey, here are some of my baseline lending options um, on this. And I don't have the property under contract yet, so I don't have a term sheet of the loan because that comes after having the property under contract. But um, now I'm gonna change to a different property in a different city, or it's going to be a different property type, or it's going to be a different loan size, you may be matched to different lenders now. And so um, one of two things is going to happen. One, it's going to be a lot of work to keep up with, oh man, like this lender that I talked to that loved my last deal, but I didn't win that deal. They don't like my next deal because of X, Y, Z. Um, you can do a lot of work to try to keep up with that with hundreds of different lenders that might be relevant to you. Or you have to go to someone who has that up-to-date information. So that can be a traditional loan broker, traditional commercial mortgage broker. They do just as much work because they're trying to keep up with these relationships, but they'll do it for you and you pay them a fee to do it. Um, what we tried to do is fuse together, hey, what are the good parts of commercial mortgage brokers? The fact that they know a lot of lenders, great, that's, that's awesome. The fact that they have seen a hundred deals and they know what the pitfalls are and they know how to underwrite these things, that's great. But all that work has to happen. You need to do all that manual work. You need to show these, you need to build a package about the deal and show it all to lenders. Can't that part be automated? Can't we match you to here are the lenders that are relevant by address and deal metrics? Um, can't we? And the answer is, is yes, we could, but commercial mortgage brokerages weren't automating anything. They weren't building a portal that can automate the broker job. They weren't trying to give transparency 
to the real estate investor. So what we did is we fused those two things together. Transparency and efficiency of having that tech that automates pieces of the process with having a capital advisor um, that can answer the questions, act as the expert, give the advice on the underwriting, um, and we fuse those two together in that stack source. Yeah, because as an investor too, even as syndicators, when you start looking at properties and you look at different locations, you know, as an end user, you're saying, I need to go talk to all these different agents. I need to talk to different um, property managers. I need to talk to different lenders in every single state. And I'm comparing 10 different states, for example. Even if I identify one, it doesn't mean a property is really going to pop up there. And the other catch-22 is this, I need to get in contract before I can get my loan. But what happens if the loan won't even qualify for the con with the contract? And yeah. Then it's like, okay, you waste everyone's time. So it gets complicated that way until you start having experience. And then once you have experience, you already know, okay, I, my lenders can do this. I know what I want. I know the target and I can yeah. make it work. But for small mom and pops, it's just so much work to do it and they get frustrated and they don't do it. But for you guys, if you guys can make a way, like you mentioned, everything's transparent. You're ident putting, putting all your information, you're helping them build a package and you're able to research and identify all the lenders who would fit that criteria they can yep. look at it and say yeah it makes sense for us here now here's the best rates best, the best terms and here's how they're different and then you can choose as an end user that's so much easier yeah yeah that's that's the goal is it should be simple and transparent to know what your financing options are on any given multifamily or commercial deal yeah, because most lenders, for example, if you're an end user, you're most likely going to identify two, three, four, five lenders. You're not going to go identify 10, 40. In residential, you, those mortgage brokers, they can identify 40 different lenders, but off the top of their head, based on expertise, they can identify which ones would fit best for your product for you and how to help you maximize. Commercial space, it gets tougher because you know each person's individual lender, they're not going to say, hey, go to that person. He's better rates than me. I'm, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> you know, better terms. Yeah, um, the, that the value of that expertise and to be able to quickly say, listen, we're going to get you the exact term sheet once you're ready. But on this type of deal, here are going to be the edges. This is what you need to plug into your underwriting model for it to make sense and for it to be something that's feasible. And then from the let's say from the lender's perspective, the loan originator's perspective, they're busy. They have a lot of work to do. They don't want to, they want to help you, but at the same time, how much time can they spend identifying every single property, analyzing every single property, seeing what fits in their guidelines and what makes sense. And if you're changing markets, then it gets harder. But if you're in one market, it's a little bit easier. They know the base numbers and they'll run it for you. But yeah, they, they'll still take a 24 hour turn time. But if you're trying to find an off market deal and you don't have 24 hours to spend because you're trying to lock in a deal at under 25% under market value right now with COVID going on, then you got to mm -hmm. move fast. You got to know it and you know, lock in the contract right away. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you can burn a lender relationship by asking them to manually review and underwrite too many deals without them being rewarded with a loan, because you have to think, what is their goal? Their goal is to have a pipeline of doable loans. They, uh, truthfully, they want to get as many good loans in the door with as least work as possible. Mm -hmm. And so if you're that investor begging them for free work all the time without actually getting them a loan to close, eventually you're going to burn that relationship and even yeah even that too and the fact is if you're a newer investor and it's your first time they know it's a lot of work too and depending on the dollar amount is it worth their time and they're busy trying to do all the easy good deals that make sense that's fast because they're trying to provide that level of service to be fair they want to give five-star service to everyone they can help do a deal as a new one new investor you might be like well i'm not sure yet even if the loan qualifies i'm still not confident enough to do the, the deal right Right. So I guess a little tricky there. So that's where like kind of the expertise, the relationships, the agents who help in because they know our history, like, okay, Matt's clients can easily get the loan. They know what they're doing. He's helping what they're doing. We're reviewing it. It makes sense. But it's also the transparency of how do you I um, cross compare different lenders for the, the investor. And then, you know, some lenders, they don't want you to shop, the, shop their deal because they just did all the work. But if you have a system that shops the deal for you, then it's all fair game. Yeah. And, and here you can also borrow credibility. So like, just like partnering with another more experienced investor is a good move early on in your real estate investment journey. Um, you know, borrowing the credibility in, in this area on the financing side is great too, because if you're working with a capital advisor that's been putting together these deals for 20 years, they have direct relationships with some of these lenders and even the ones that they don't, and they're working with them for the first time, but their underwriting is going to be clean. They know all the pitfalls that um, that need to be worked through. 
they're going to they're going to have a different type of pitch. And especially if they can say, listen, I'm working with I'm, I'm not just working with Matthew, but I'm going to have 50 more Matthews to work with. If you do a good job for me, Mr. Lender, um, there's a level of leverage there um, that doesn't exist as a newer real estate investor going out to lenders alone. And there's one more thing too. Like, let's talk about the seller side of things. When a seller sees it and they see a credible agent investor, they see a credible client with a credible lending company, then they go, okay, I actually know that lending company. They are pretty good at lending and they know what they're doing. They close deals all the time. But if it's like some uh, lender out there who you never even heard of, it's like, okay, I'm taking additional risk now too. Does that lender know what they're doing? Is the, um, the investor know what they're doing and their first time investor, even sellers ask you too to prove yourself too. Are you a first time investor or you, you know, how, how are you buying this property? Cause they don't want to waste their time to be fair. They don't want to spend 30, 60, 90 days in contract to fail. Even more than the sellers, the investment sales broker may not even want to, they, they may be steering you, the seller away from it. So it, that's even an interesting dynamic. If you're a, if you're a selling broker mm -hmm. for a multifamily or a commercial deal, you're going to steer your client to take somebody that has a certainty of execution because you want to make your commission. Uh, and the seller should want the same thing. They want certainty of execution. So they're not wasting their time. Even if somebody has a higher offer, uh, if they've never executed on transaction, they don't know what it takes. Um, you may prefer somebody that's executed more transactions, even if their offer is slightly lower. Exactly. So then, you know, all these things build up in the commercial space. The fun part of it is, Hey, I love multi-units. I love commercial space. I love building and scaling because there's certain metrics, you know, you're just automatically adding value. You book this, you get this. In residential is, you know, a gamble. You can make a lot of equity, but there's no certainty. There's no finite numbers of saying, hey, if I add a hundred dollars to the door, I make this X amount, uh, you know, GRM, then great. And you know, your cash on cash numbers. Great. So that's the fun part of it too. How does um, Stack Source? do their loans like how do you guys underwrite deals in your system and like how do you use that to leverage or to find the best lender for the client are you guys doing parts of the underwriting systems and packaging it you're packaging it all up and providing it like a broker right yeah so our, our business model uh we are not a direct lender because we chose hey we want to be borrower advocates rather than pushing our own loan product right so we made the, we made the choice we're going to be a platform where these different capital providers and lenders um, are playing on one side and ready for the deals. We keep up to date with them. We've got partnerships with them. Um, but on the other side, we're, we're completely in the borrower's favor, the, the sponsor, the deal sponsor. Um, and we're trying to negotiate with these lenders on their behalf. So the way we do that um, is, first of all, we need to in, intake all the information about the deal. So. Majority of the time, that's somebody coming to our web portal, putting in the address of the property and some of the underwriting they've already done and, you know, information that's going to be combined with other information that we can ingest from other sources of comps and um, values of other buildings and, you know, information about the zip code that it's in. So we're going to take what the borrower already has, combine it with our own data that goes through our analyst team. Um, so there's... There's an, what happens instantly is you're matched with lenders and you can see that. And here's the types of loan programs that I might qualify for. But before getting hard quotes, that's going to go through a human analyst team at StackSource that's going to check on the underwriting, make sure that it's sound, make sure that this is the type of property and the type of deal and the type of borrower. It's a real borrower. And it's something that if we show to our lending partners and our capital sources, you know, it's not going to waste their time. It's going to be a good use. Um, so that, that packaging all happens within StackSource and on the platform. A lot of it is automated. Some of it like going through the human underwriting and checking for errors. That's, that would be humans. Um, that, um, so you get to see your loan options right away. Sometimes you can get an instant soft quote, um, but depending on the property type, depending on the size, um, for some stabilized multifamily properties that are, you know, have a good income history, you can get an automated soft quote. Um, usually it will be, here are the lenders we can go out to. If your deal qualifies and has the right information, you're going to get competitive quotes from multiple lenders that you can then compare and analyze. Nice. I like that too, because it makes it so much easier because yeah, for us as investors, we want to see that transparency. We want to know our numbers, our options, compare which one's the best one for us based on the term, the term sheet, and then utilize that. And yeah, if, especially when you find good reputable lenders who can close the deal, 
then it's even so much easier. And then once you get used to that, it gets so much easier just to repeat a lot of business because once you're in commercial space, you're going to keep reinvesting over and over and over again. And once you find good lenders who can close a deal and don't stress you out the whole 30, 60 days, you know, some lenders do because you're in contract and then communication has gone. Oh, I'm just waiting for the underwriter. I'm just waiting for them. I seen before in history, I seen some, you know, lenders be paper pushers, right? They're just always waiting for that. And it's policy based. Okay. Well, I'm screwed because you're just waiting on a big uh, bank company, just waiting for their, you know, to, for them to do everything. And you're stuck in the middle without knowing what's going on. There's no transparency. It's just lack of communication. So that hurts business by far and hurts referrals uh, indefinitely. But in the yeah. commercial space too, yeah, if you can create that transparency, the communication, know what step I'm on, know what you need, know what's next. Residential has been getting a lot better doing that now. Residential has been showing a lot more. You see the systems going up. Like one company we see online, you know, Rocket Mortgage has been, you know, pushing their way through and like, you know. Huge. They've over. gotten huge. They got huge, but they got huge over the years. They got huge really quickly. But their model, you see, was like lightning speed, right? Transparency and like good rates. And even I don't use them, but the fact I see them growing and people are talking about it more and more. How does, I think how in 2021, mm-hmm. sorry to cut you off, Matthew. I think in 2021, like one out of every 11 residential loans went through Rocket Mortgage. Mm-hmm. So that's, I mean, that's enormous. Their market share has gotten huge. They're the number one in the country now. And you're right. It's because they have invested a lot into the technology of making things more efficient, making things more transparent. Um, and again, residential is simpler. So you do it for a few different loan scenarios and you can address 90% of the market. Uh, and then of the of the market they can address, they're doing like ten percent market share nearly. So um, that that's going to happen in commercial mortgage for certain loan scenarios that are more simply underwritten. Maybe not for the majority of commercial mortgages will we have like automated soft quotes, but it could be as much as forty percent of the commercial mortgage market someday can have automated soft quotes and online you know simple closing checklists. Um, and um, you know for the ones that can't transparency is still an asset. Yeah, I think if even if you cannot do it, as long as you're transparent and com- communicative throughout the process, then it makes it a, a really easy to understand and digest it. And like, hey, you have a unique situation. It's not easy cut cookie cutter, but here's how we help you. Here's how we're transparent. Here's how we show you the numbers and see what works for you. And we'll figure it out together. But yeah, by doing that, you're providing an extra level of service. And like, for example, just comparing the residential side, like what do you see in the beginning when Rocket Mortgage first started? What did you see them do to really scale the business to grow it in that side? Like, what were they? What were the primary things they were fixing first? Oh, well, I, I think the the efficiency of the process is something they've always focused on. Uh, I'll also say they've done they've done a lot of marketing um, yeah. because on the consumer side, name recognition is is huge, right? So, like, there's there have been Rocket Mortgage commercials at the Super Bowl for several years. We don't, don't ever expect to see a stack source commercial at the Super Bowl because that doesn't matter. Like the average person doesn't need to know what stack source is. Yeah. Real estate, we need to know, we need real estate investors to know who we are. Uh, we need lenders to know who we are, but we don't care about like the country or the world knowing about, about us. Rocket mortgages had to spend a lot on marketing because everybody needs to know them. You're not going to hear of it for the first time like through like an internet ad or like a mailer that they send and just click and trust it. There, there has to be a level of trust. Um, so doing transactions and having a level of trust uh, and honestly, just having a level of certainty of execution is super important. Uh, and that's important for any lender on either side of the house, whether you're commercial, whether you're residential, the fastest way you can destroy your lending business is to start destroying trust that borrowers have in the process. Because if you start putting out quotes and term sheets that you can't honor, that you can't close, that you're gonna have to change the terms after somebody signed and agreed and sent a deposit, like that's a great way to lose trust. Now that's unfortunately not uncommon in commercial mortgage land to say, hey, based on what you've told me so far, here's a, t- here's a term sheet where you're three and a half percent fixed rate and 80% LTV and you know, here's all the things that we can do. And the borrower says, great, this makes my deal work. And I can, you know, sign that contract and go through. And only after the financing contingency ends, do you find out, well, this went through the credit committee at the bank. And we're a little bit worried about the risk in this neighborhood. And it's at 75% now. That five extra percent that you have to come up with cash that we weren't budgeting for could be a major problem. You might have told investors partnering with you that, 
you had an 80% loan and now it's 75 or now the interest rate is different. That's a great way to mess up your lending business over time, but it, it, it happens in commercial mortgage. So one of the things that we're really focused on is not just what are the rates and terms that are quoted, but how happy have other borrowers been with their closing process? And what is their typical turnaround time? And how organized are they? And giving transparency even into that level and the qualitative aspects of a lender and the lender relationship um, that we can show to borrowers going through our, our process. And I think a good terminology is that, like I see some companies, they use NPS surveys and the NPS yes. survey is basically just, you know, net promoter survey, right? Really finding your true value of to your clientele and the service level and trying to always exceed their expectations and keeping that trust factor first, exceeding their expectations and providing the quality of service. Kind of like, for example, like Ritz Carlton, something five-star service, like you always think of it, but when you keep that level of service, you feel more trust, more confident, knowing the fact that, Hey, I can come back here. I can refer my people, my friends, family here. I can trust that they're going to do the right thing to help my clients. And their focus is on keeping that high level of service. Like you mentioned, once you drop that service down, I can't trust you. The loan that fails, I'm going to tell everyone it failed. I'm never using you. I'm going to, you know, one bad review can go to seven plus people, right? One good review only goes to one person. We have to work so much harder for that one good review versus bad publicity. And yeah, even for me, like if a lender kills my deal, I'm like, I'm never using that you or maybe the company. Because and yeah, where would you post that today online? You might post it on social media. Uh, so now with Source, you can also give live feedback onto your experience with different lenders and you know, like Yelp for restaurants and Google Maps or, you know, Uber, you can give feedback on your driver. You'll be able to give feedback on your lender through Source, and we'll publish those things and give ratings. And, you know, that'll be another level of the transparency we're aiming to build. That's nice too, because when, when you start seeing like one review, okay, that's a fake review, right? When you start seeing a hundred reviews, <laughs> like, that is probably not fake at all now. They could buy it. But of course, if you see authentic reviews, you're more likely you're building trust and confidence for that person. Hey, check them out. See if it makes sense for your for your investment. And maybe they are, right? And for us invest uh, agents, you know, we look at it too. Like we always want to build a great team. Like your your team matters and having a great vendor team of different parties and lawyers and lending, commercial lending and you know, contractors and everything. It makes sense. You need to find really good people. Everyone's always looking for good lenders because a lot of lenders out there, they're also bombarded by how much business there is. Like 2022 has been crazy. 2021's already, you know, like past has already been going, it's blowing up. Even this year's blowing up still. Um, and it's hard because everyone has so much limited time to do business and they want to focus on the quality. And it's hard to do that much. But if you start automating it and sourcing it out and making it easier to build the investor package, then it gets a lot funner, gets a lot faster, gets a lot easier, less stressful. And then people want to do more business with you guys. Mm. Yes. Uh, that's if, if people can be more confident, that not just for stack source, if, if real estate investors in general can feel more confident with the financing sources that they're interacting with, if that's the one thing we do for this industry, that is a win. Yeah, I, I would say so too, because when I was looking in different states, I, I have to talk to so many different lenders in all these different states, and I don't even have the deal in, in contract yet, I'm, but I'm looking at the, just the, the what they're providing for each area, and like, you have to talk to so many different lenders in that specific city, state, area, and then, you know, go through all their sheets. It's so much, so much work, so I'm glad that you guys are doing this, and that you guys are kind of like, you know, focusing on the prop tech. Can you tell us more, like, what does prop tech mean, and why are people even focusing on it, and how are they yeah. changing the industry? Yeah, prop tech, I would say, is interchangeable with real estate tech. Um, you know, so you can call it either one. Uh, prop tech is is probably the more common industry term at this point. So like in, in Europe, they would rather than calling it the real estate market, they'd call it the property market. And so that kind of stuck in the, the tech community. So it's this prop tech. It's received a lot more investment in these last few years from venture capital. Um, there's a lot coming residential, commercial. Um, sometimes it's these tech enabled service providers. Um, sometimes it's data platforms. Um, so you can tap real estate sources of data uh, for comps and, and such, but also other forms of data that can be used to indicate values in real estate. Um, there are um, portals, there are deal management platforms and CRMs and all sorts of things coming down the pike uh, for, for prop tech. Um, PropTech has grown in investment and in value like each of the last three years. Um, and um, I, it's getting to the point where like with the, with the amount of investment and innovation going on, both through startups and through 
now, now a few larger companies starting to catch up and saying, well, hey, real estate has traditionally had the lowest R&D spending out of any major industry. Um, that, is, that is starting to change slowly, where even the large incumbent companies and real estate services companies are investing more in tech. Um, but just looking at how much investment is going into it alone, real estate is going to be a lot different five or 10 years from now and for the better. Um, and service providers and professionals that can look ahead to what's coming and what's going to be different. It, it's really looking at what do clients want? What do end users want? Do end users and clients want these trends that technology can bring to them? And can you align yourself with that as a professional? Because being a real estate agent is completely different than it was 20 years ago before people could look online for properties. Now it's more consultative and it's more you're the expert that's helping them with the process rather than the one holding the keys to all the information. There may be some of that left, but you can't think of it in that protection way. You have to think of how different will the world be? How do I align with what clients really want? Nice. Let's, let's talk about this too. We have some time left. I want to talk about this too. Okay. Um, now, we're, for example, we're working with small mom and pop investors and they want to start doing commercial investing. What, what tips would you give them to really start doing commercial investing? Even if you've done one or 10 deals, like what tips do you give them to really get into the commercial space and how do you get to the space to get into the deals? And also, how do you tie that into financing and how do they start building it? We talked about a couple of them, but let's kind of dive more into first part. How do they start getting to commercial investing? Yes. Um, okay. So commercial as a term, um, it could mean a couple things. Uh, I, for financing, to jump ahead, it, it can still be housing. It could be apartments. But as soon as you get to five units or more in a portfolio or in one property, so an apartment complex, as soon as you hit that five unit, you're commercial from a financing standpoint, meaning you can't use a residential mortgage to buy that property. You're going to need a commercial mortgage. The other types of commercial real estate are anything used by a company. Um, so offices, retail, industrial, hotels and hospitality, storage facilities. These are all different asset, sub-asset classes of the larger umbrella of commercial real estate. Um, multifamily and apartments and you know, mobile home parks and other, other, other places where people live, they're gonna be most similar to residential investing because again, it's where people live. The underwriting might be a little bit different on the financing side, um, but at the end of the day, you're providing the same need just more densely uh, if you're doing multifamily versus single family, you're providing a different need if you're going to a different commercial asset class and you're catering to not consumers that are trying to live somewhere, but you're catering to companies. So uh, industrial, it could be an online retailer that needs warehouse space um, for you know their business. Uh, for a hotel, it's usually something that, well, it's usually you operate the business and the property that it operates in. Um, and, and so you're, you have a different client base uh, and the clients can be companies. Um, and so that's, it's a different leasing structure. You need to understand the leasing structure to be a good investor. So you need to spend time around commercial leasing agents to really understand that, um, you know, get involved in commercial deals in some way where you understand that the leases are big multi-year negotiations and that's what makes or breaks the revenue in your building. So that's the first thing to understand for commercial real estate is it's varied. It doesn't just mean one thing. And you need to be good at the specific asset class and learn the ins and outs of it. Okay, and then now from the like the financing perspective of it too, like especially when you started, what would you recommend they uh, people start learning about in the financing uh, for investments, and what should they start packaging together themselves? Yes. So um, whether you're doing a portfolio of more than five homes at once, a multifamily of five plus units, or a commercial. Those are all typically financed with a commercial mortgage. Commercial mortgages will be different than a residential consumer mortgage in a few important ways. Um, one is leverage. Um, you typically don't see as high leverage, meaning you're going to need more equity or a larger down payment for a commercial property than you do on the typical residential. Um, another thing is that their commercial mortgages can be recourse or non-recourse. And that's a, that's a, uh, term that you used earlier. What recourse means, if you have a full recourse loan, that means if I default on my property payments, not only does the bank or the lender come and take the property back, but I would have to make up for any deficiency in the loan balance too. 
So if the value of my property falls in half because I mismanage it and the income's gone and I lost all my tenants, um, not only are you going to have to give the property back, but you're going to have to make good on the loan and pay back the rest of the loan somehow. So that's something to know is that there, are, there can be recourse. So there's a higher level of risk involved in taking commercial financing versus taking a residential mortgage, which typically ends at, well, I lost my home, but I still have my other assets. Um, another, another common occurrence on commercial mortgages would be prepayment penalties um, and different loan terms. So if you're used to getting a 30 year mortgage, buying a home or a residential investment property, they are rare in commercial mortgages. There, there are places where you can get a 30 year commercial mortgage, but they're expensive and it's only for certain property types in certain locations. More often you have a loan term that's shorter. You may need to pay back that loan in five, seven or 10 years. Now that doesn't mean you're paying back the entire balance over those five, seven or 10 years. You may be paying it off based on a longer schedule. That's called amortization. So 25 year amortization, 30 year amortization, you're paying it down as if it took 25 years to pay off or as if it took 30 years to pay off. But after seven years, you may owe the full balance, meaning you have to make that last 23 years of payments all in one day. So what do you do? Well, you refinance the property and get a new loan or you sell the property. And so you, you kind of have this time trigger for most commercial financing scenarios where Every five, seven, 10 years, or, or even shorter, if you're doing a big value add with a bridge loan, maybe after two years, you have to pay off the loan somehow. Refinance, sell those, or, or pay cash. I mean, if you have that type of cash, most people do not just repay it all with cash. It's mostly refinances or selling the property. Um, and if you want to sell early, you may be paying a penalty on, the, on your loan amount to the bank because they were expecting to keep getting interest payments on that loan until that big payoff day. That's what they were expecting. If you pay back early, they can charge you fees to do so. So those are some of the major differences in the terms of a commercial mortgage. Uh, it will vary widely. I, just like just like the asset classes, like just because you've owned an office building doesn't mean that you're ready to own a hotel. You need to know the differences between those two. There will be differences in commercial mortgage products as well. And that's where somebody more experienced or a capital advisor can kind of take you to the next step and say, Hey, let's dig into more, some more of these differences. Nice. And one last thing too, um, on your website, do you guys show like non-recourse loans and like, you know, it's like in your uh, table, for example, a show one lender shows non-recourse, another lender might show recourse and you can see these options easily transparently. And you can say, Hey, non-recourse makes more sense. I can qualify for that. I would love to get a non-recourse loan. You know? Yes. Yes. Um, so there will be non-recourse and recourse products available for just about every property. Um, one thing we support is you can say, hey, I'm only looking at non-recourse options and you'll only match to non-recourse options. Not every property can be financed non-recourse uh, and not every borrower is going to qualify for it. So uh, it is great to have non-recourse because you can scale your portfolio without like pledging your personal assets on everything. Um the first non-recourse loan that many investors will qualify for, and let's stick with multifamily, which is yeah. honestly the most common step up into commercial out of any of these asset classes. Multifamily is often the first commercial asset class that people touch. It's most similar to residential. Um, it has There's a huge need for it in the country. There's lots of reasons why people get into multifamily. But um, the, the smallest non-recourse loans will be at least a million dollars. Um, they're gonna be backed by a government agency by uh, uh, like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, which are the same ones that play on the residential side that back a majority of loans on the residential side. They do not, ma they do not back the majority of loans in commercial real estate, but they do back a good deal of loans. They are non-recourse when they back a loan. They have certain strict underwriting standards. So you need to have occupancy of at least 90% in your property for the last three months. You have to have a certain amount of income. You also need to have a certain amount of experience, net worth, and liquidity for them to say you're eligible as a borrower. Um, so sometimes a newer investor, they might have a property that qualifies for non-recourse financing with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac backing, but they don't personally qualify based on their experiences or their finances. In those cases, it is sometimes possible to bring in a partner 
that backs the loan that qualifies. Um, so we actually do have a couple of these, you know, buddy investors in our network, uh, to say it that way, that can kind of act as a almost a multifamily investment co-founder that that will back your first loan or two. They'll take fees in the deal or they'll take a small piece of ownership in the deal for helping an investor qualify for non-recourse. Nice. I like that. It's always good to have really good key, uh, KPs to help you back deals when you can you know, find a good deal, right, to put together. That's always great to hear that too. Okay. One last question too. You know, for when you built this company, you built this business, what are some key tips you would give people to really think about building their real estate investing, their business, their portfolios, and like keys to success and any mistakes you think that we should all try to avoid? We all have natural strengths and weaknesses. Um, and you, you, you have to be learning to be, to be an entrepreneur, whether, whether it be a real estate portfolio and you're learning to build it, a software business and learning to build it, you need to be learning. But also you can't just rely on what you know and what your own strengths are in order to get further. Um, often, you know, with, with very rare exceptions of people that are like the best entrepreneurs and business people in the world. And even then, those people and any successful entrepreneur, you need to find out who else's knowledge can I leverage? And how do I set up relationships? So that could be mentors, advisors, and coworkers. Uh, so for myself, uh, we have an advisory board at Stacksworth that are experts in fintech and real estate data and real estate investment. Um, I've had mentors in my career that I've tried to ask a lot of questions and learn from. Um, and then, you know, you get to the point where something is up and running and, you know, there's some, there's some traction. You can't do it yourself. Um, you need to build a team. And that could be a, in real estate, that can be deal by deal. I'm going to partner with this person on that deal. And it could be that. Um, eventually, if you turn into a real estate investment company or any company, then you start to build the team of employees. Um, one person can't conquer the world. That's impossible. The greatest people in history um, that have conquered countries and created empires, was it that one person? Did they go out into the field and swing a sword and you know, uh, con conquer you know, some continent? No way. It was the people and the influence and the connections. So that's, that's how you get further, um, is you start to build that, that web of people that you can rely on in different ways. Mentors, advisors, partners, Coworkers, um, that's been really critical for for us. And I honestly, I've seen that again and again with real estate investors. The ones that are going alone never make it as far as the ones that build a really good team around them. Nice, I love it. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You can never win alone. You got to build. You want to go fast, you go yourself, right? You want to go far, you got to go with the team. That's so true. It really, it really does matter. I believe in the same thing as you, like having the mentorship, having the coaching, having guidance, having experts who done it who can help you do it faster they're helping you scale years ahead because you're listening to their advice it might not be up to the time for example if you think so but actually their experience matters so much because they lived the history they they de dealt with things you haven't seen before and what you don't know is what you don't know and they can share that with you and by doing that you're scaling way easier way faster without the stress if you think about pinching the money dollar for dollar you're actually missing out on the opportunity that, that opportunity cost the experience you're not you're paying for or the percentage of share is so much more valuable I'll take 50% any day versus 100% of nothing. That doesn't even matter no more because you never got there. Yeah. How do I get to 588 units? Not by myself. We had a whole team. I would never have gotten it by myself. Now I can say, hey, here's my group. Here's what we do. Here's how we get there. Here's all the vendors we work with. That's hard. Yeah, that is, that's the hard part, but the rewarding part. Exactly. So, all right, Tim, um, last thing, tell us about why they should use Stacksworth, what is it really for them? And why is it just worth checking out and trying it out and any questions that can connect with you guys? Well, if you're a real estate investor curious about, are there better financing options out there available for me on a given property? That is the reason why most investors hop online, chat with us, give us a call, all of the above. Um, that's really it. Is there a lower rate? Is there more leverage? Is there non-recourse? Is there something better out there that I don't know? Or do I need my help? Do I need help getting a deal done? Do I need help getting the capital together on this deal? Those are really the two reasons where, why people use our team. Uh, we're a growing team. We now have more than 25 people across the country. Um, we, are, we are one of the fastest commercial mortgage 
fastest growing commercial mortgage companies in the country. Uh, we're trying to do right by every single client and every single person that's using our platform. Um, we believe in this stuff and we love this stuff and we live and breathe real estate finance. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out to me at Tim at stacksource.com or, you know, find one of my teammates at, at stacksource.com. Um, if you'd like to get in contact or if you just like to chat about this stuff further, for sure. Cool. Last thing. Do you guys also do commercial real estate refinancing? So for example, we have a property, it's going to be running up of the prepayment penalties and we want to refinance, calculate the refinance, see what you guys can do in comparison. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and in refinance is often finding the very best interest rate could be the driver. Like, Hey, we, we have this deal. It's not, there's no time, you know, our, our loan comes up in a few months, but like, I'm not strapped for time. It's not about the efficiency. It's literally just about finding the best interest rate or the most leverage or like the very best takeout loan. You've got some time to do it. Why shouldn't you know every option available to you on the market? And that's something that we facilitate. So development too. So acquiring properties, refinancing properties, developing new properties and getting a construction loan. We, we address all of those. Okay, perfect. Everyone out there, thanks so much for being on the show, listening to Tim and StackSource. And even for myself and my team, you know, definitely look forward to trying you guys out, seeing what my clients can do with you and how that compares to what they're currently getting. And look forward to telling those results to our investor clients out there. Uh, thank you so much, Tim, everyone out there. Thank you guys for being on the Truth About Real Estate podcast. We'll see you guys in the next one. Have a great day. Thanks, Matthew.